Thank you. Fair enough. Uh, hello and welcome. Uh, my name is John O'Connor. Uh, I'm a real estate litigator uh, with Clark Hill. We've got a number of my colleagues here tonight. Thank you very much for coming. Um, I'm also a proud, more importantly, I'm a proud lion in the class of 2009. Uh, and I'm also, yeah, no. <laughs> I know we all want. Yes. Uh, I'm also co chair of the alumni committee with uh, my dear friend, Ed Gard over here, and one of the hosts for tonight on behalf of the Royal Mary Mountain Real Estate Advisory Council, also in the BREE Act. Uh, tonight, it's my distinct pleasure to introduce our commercial and industrial real estate market trends panelists. It's a bit of a word suit, but we'll rock it. Uh, and tonight, we'll be discussing uh, various topics uh, the outlook for commercial real estate, drivers affecting growth. Uh, the impact of changing interest rates and, and how in the past few months that, that continues to change. Uh, supply change and its impact on industrial real estate. Uh, a significant amount of mortgage debt maturation in 2024, which is very substantial and kind of present. Uh, strategies for investing and for the students out there, skill sets that are going to make them more marketable uh, in the field today. Um, so uh, thereafter, it's my, my pleasure to introduce uh, our panelists for the evening, it's not going to be in order because I can't really see it where we sit. But uh, first, right here, we have Mackenzie Terry. Uh, she was. Uh, she is associate director at Walker and Dunlap, and she works in the uh, multi family lending group. Uh, my understanding is she's been in the industry for more than a decade, though so it's not much better. You're very welcome. Uh, she is also a class of, uh, she's also an alum of the class of 2010. So, very close to uh, Next, we have uh, Lindsay Spooks. Uh, she is director of multifamily production at Everbank. Uh, impressively, during her career, she's closed, and I just found this out on LinkedIn today, uh, 2 billion uh, in income property loans over the course of her career, which is very impressive. Um, and she is a double alum. She's an alum from the uh, undergrad class of 2002 and MBA program in 2009. Uh, so welcome to you. <laughs> Next, we got my dear friend, Hunter McDonald. Uh, he is managing director uh, at JLL and he's class of 08. It's great to see you, man. It's been very fun to watch. Uh, we've got David Rosenthal, President and CEO of Curtis and Rosenthal, uh, which is an appraisal group, and he's a master on uh, commercial real estate valuations. And lastly, we've got Dawson Rowe, and he, my understanding is he's affiliated with LMU um, via his relationship with Dr. Manning, who's out there somewhere, told him shadow was inevitable. Um, and I know who many of you uh, know and love through the CPA program. Uh, and last, we have Dawson Reiner. This is fortunate. Uh, we're really happy to have him again. Uh, this is his second time up here on the panel. So we very much appreciate that. He's regional manager for Marcus from Uh Welcome to you all. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, I want to give a couple thank yous as well. I really want to thank both Nancy Donovan and Hugo Rodriguez for really helping us out. Without <laughs> And lastly, I need to introduce uh, my, my partner in crime on this, Edgar Asensio, uh, principal of Asensio Real Estate Brokerage. He'll be moderating, moderating the team. Thank you. The room is amazing, guys. I'm so happy to be here tonight. By the way, we have some celebrities in the house. And uh, first of all, what Dr. Manning? And you reached me with our alumni group and the advisory council. Welcome, uh, Dr. Manning. So happy to see you and uh, that you made it. By the way, before I continue, I just want to let you know that we have one more celebrity in the house, and it's uh, Mackenzie's uh, dad. Who is he? Oh, I see him. <laughs> So, John Kerr is one of the founders of what company? Dawson? Uh, Marcus and Miller Chat. There you go. It's an honor to have you tonight, uh, John. Thank you. You and I, we met uh, maybe 12 years ago, remember? Right. In your office in Calabasas. You sat me down in front of you. I told you about my dreams 
my broker's company to purchase my office building. And you said to me, Edgar, to make money, get wealthy, get more agents, and buy, buy more properties. So I, I follow your advice, uh, John. <laughs> Welcome. You know, I just want to get a feel of the room. You know, um, how many students do we have tonight? Can you raise your hand? Whoa, that's amazing. Congratulations. Thank you for being here. How many students from the uh, Real Estate Society tonight? Whoa, at least 20, 20, 21. Okay, welcome. How many alums do we have? Oh, this is the question that I asked, and I love asking this question, by the way. In the room, how many parents do we have tonight? <laughs> Look at that, LMU parents. Congratulations. Can you stand up so we can give you a round of applause? It's an honor to have you. Bring all the parents. Thank you. Come on. You know how hard it is to have a parent come to an event at LMU? This is an accomplishment, I'm telling you. I'm so happy to have you tonight, so welcome. You know, I own a commercial real estate company uh, in Torrance, and um, I made a decision many years ago to, instead of going to go work for a Marcus or Mellie shop or Dale L, uh, to just set up my own company, you know, and so I follow my entrepreneurial mindset, you know, and um, so how many of you are a part of the entrepreneurship program here at school? Okay, welcome. So you can relate to me what I'm saying to you too. Welcome. We have about six, seven. So you can relate to me what I'm going to say that the sky is the limit in real estate when you have that mindset. And that's applicable in any career, by the way. So what I did, I decided to, instead of leasing an office space, I purchased my first building office space and I'm so proud and I've been there for the past 15 years. And I'm telling you, I wanna motivate all of you students that it's it's possible to do that. It's just a mindset that you have a, a dream, it's possible to, to make it happen. You know, all those buildings here in Playa Vista, you know, 100 units, 200 units, someone owns those properties, right? Syndication, LLC, or maybe a couple of friends, you know? So it is possible to own bigger buildings. If you want to have a portfolio of small properties, you can do that as well. And that's what I teach in my real estate 1031 exchange class. I motivate students to keep that in mind. So thank you students for coming and I hope that learned so much from all our panelists. This is an elite set of colleagues that I have here tonight. I just want to tell you that to put them together, to come to LMU, volunteer their time is a huge deal. So every minute that we're going to be here tonight, let's, let's digest every information that we're going to get because we are going to talk about reality check, what's going on in the market, you know? And so here's one of them. Look at that. How many rate hikes in 2021? Do you see that? Seven times. I mean, that, that, it's incredible, right? In one year, seven times they raised the rates. Look what happened the next year. 2023, four times. It's astonishing that that stat. You know, that's that's a fun fact, but it's not fun for some people. You know, for some investors. So that that changes that changes the the marketplace, right? Right. That's that's significant. But there are always strategies that you can do to keep going, to keep purchasing, refinance later. And we have experts, Lindsay and McKinsey, they're experts in structuring deals. And we're going to learn so much from them, what's available in the marketplace. My friend Ryan is here. You know, you want a lot of profits, my friend. And I know that we're going to get a lot of good information to purchase more portfolios. You know, anyways, let's begin. How did you get started in your business, uh, your career? Uh, uh, well, I, I really took the groundwork for my career you know, during my time here at LMU, and obviously giving it to the whole students here in the audience. Um, I was a business major, focused on several finance courses. 
uh, some of my more memorable courses would have been Professor Manning's commercial real estate finance course, which you know, directly relates to what I do on a daily basis. Uh, and just touched on entrepreneurship. Um, Dr. Kiesner was a professor here while I attended, and this class is another class that was very memorable and impressionable in you know, starting my career. Um, with that said, as far as work experience, I actually started working in the industry while I was undergrad here at LMU. Um, I got my first job working at a single family mortgage brokerage company, actually through a connection with a roommate. Um, and when I say I started at the bottom, I really mean it. Uh, the job I started doing no longer exists. Uh, my first job in the real estate industry was copying loan files to send to lenders, something that you know we don't even do with today based on the current technology. But you know, worked my way up on the mortgage broker side, and uh, shortly after graduation, transitioned to the lending side, focusing on uh, multifamily loan production. And I've been working in that space ever since. Um, I started as a loan analyst for many years as for a, a large loan producer, and have worked my way up to a director of loan production. And although I've changed companies several times over the course of my 20 year career in multifamily production, doing the different acquisitions and acquisitions, I really maintained my working relationship with the, with the same executive team. So it's been a, it's been a great run from, from school to where I am now. Thank you, Lisa. How are you, Mackenzie? Okay, so I started um, my career as an intern at Marks and Melinda. Luckily, I had a little connection. Um, and I actually then went, and that was on the investment sales side. And then I realized that I like the finance side better. So then I changed over to the mortgage broker side. And then one of my mentors told me that you should really learn the the agency underwriting. And if you can learn that, then you're then you're golden. So then I went to the agency underwriting side and started as an analyst and then again worked my way up um, as a transaction manager and then now I'm on the production side. So I've been actually in the agency space for a very long time, probably like eight years. So I know the ins and outs of agency finance. Thank you. How many people in finance are right now, students? So you could relate to McKinsey and Lindsay about what you're saying, you know? So let's learn a lot from her. And uh, all of us. Are you Hunter? Uh, so I have a good amount of family uh, that is in several different sectors of real estate. So that was frankly my first introduction. Um, but I would say the way my career started would be informational interviews. Um, I was talking to a young gentleman a little bit ago who asked me what was the you know what was the, the best way to start, and that was it. Um, you push your network. You know, if real estate is what you want to do, you know, the first thing is, you know, finding out what you want to do, or kind of more importantly, finding out what you don't want to do. Um, there's a lot of venues within commercial real estate. Um, I found my way into industrial um, via figuring out that I very much did not want to do office. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, I worked in it for a year. Uh, I did downtown um, Los Angeles high rise office. And at the end of the day, walking through with attorneys, finance people, the, you know, planning out and figuring out the culture and the feeling of their office space, it just wasn't what I was looking for. Um, so while I was at JLL, you know, I'm at JLL now, but as I started at JLL, um, a friend in the research department started asking me to come to the research meetings. Um, and through that, I really started to understand the product type, the user base, um, the fact that the, you know, distribution people, the manufacturing, um, it was just significantly more exciting. You walk into a building and you're cold calling and you like never knew what you were walking into. Um, and just how people made money out of these boxes was ultimately exciting. Um, so I started at a boutique firm um, and specialized in South Bay, so port logistics, um, and got it under pretty good idea over the first five years, what I thought was a good idea, um, about how the port works, how the South Bay works. Um, after that, I kind of figured out I knew what I didn't know, um, and I moved to the Inland um, And so the Inland Empire is the largest hub of industrial real estate in the U.S., um, and it's, you know, an hour in your back door. 
Um, and so it's right around, yeah, it's right here, you know, kind of everything from call it Pomona to Paris and up to um, So I moved in uh, to a position at CBRE. Um, I spent about 10 or 11 years there um, and uh, been with now JLL back to where I started uh, for about three years. Thank you, Hunter. So Hunter made a transition students from uh, commercial real estate to industrial. And he, we're going to learn so much from him uh, later on, but uh, <laughs> industrial is uh, it's a good sector to be in nowadays. We're going to learn so much from Hunter about that. How about you, uh, David? I'm going to ask a question. Who here among the students uh, expects or hopes that your career path will be linear? Like, I'm here, and I'm going to get there, and it's going to look kind of like this. Anybody? What do you think? A little bit? No? Less than 5% of the class, you're not happy. So, I'm going to share with you my circuitous path to get to where I am. Uh, I grew up on the East Coast, born in Baltimore, grew up in Florida, went to undergrad at the University of Florida. Go Gators. <laughs> Say that. Um, I went to business school at uh, the Kellogg School of Northwestern in Chicago, just like Dr. Manning, and uh, made my way to California, uh, made my first terrific career move. My first job out of business school was working for a young startup company in 1980. It was called Intel, and it was a 10-year-old company. And I thought, wow, what could be better? So I moved to the Bay Area. Went to work for Intel, lasted about five minutes. I couldn't stand working in an environment with engineers. I was a finance guy. Didn't make sense. Uh, I quit and left two weeks before my stock options vested. Genius. Uh, but I had to take uh, a new job. I wanted to get in, into the finance industry. I took a job in corporate banking with Security Pacific Bank. Also, former home of Dr. Manning. Uh, we, we had a very similar path to start out. So uh, I was a corporate banker at Security Pacific Bank for a couple of years. And uh, through a little serendipity, I, I enjoyed the work, didn't love working in a big institution. Uh, ended up going out to work with uh, two former bankers that I knew from the bank who were trying to help Jerry Buss of the Lakers and his partner buy a savings and loan. This was in 1982, going into 1983. Um, you know how much Edgardo was telling us about how interest rates have brought up a lot? Uh, who could tell us what were interest rates in 1982, 1983? 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 18%. 
and we had a lot of debt to pay off. So I was in uh, a very bad neighborhood. I had just finished tape measuring the house and drawing a sketch on graph paper. And I was thinking to myself, this is ridiculous. I've got two good degrees from a very good school, corporate banking background. What am I doing? And then I remember I have all this debt, got to pay it off. <laughs> got to just, just hunker down and do this for me. And my partner said something I'll never forget. He said, look, even though the work that we're doing is not fun, we've got to do it like we're going to do it for the rest of our entire career. We've got to love the work that much, even though it is indeed what you want to do. And I never forgot that. So we hunkered down. We started an appraisal company. We started building it. We worked through a refi boom. Then we worked through the savings and loan crisis. And then the aftermath of that, and starting building and growing and hiring people and getting approved and raising commercial properties and getting designations and, and working for bigger, more interesting clients, expanding our footprint. And then along the way, I had a partner who did the worst thing that a partner can do to another family. Who was the case? What was it? He died. What is that? Yeah. He called. He died 48 years old, and I've got to tell you the story because I am an evangelist about this. 48 years old, never went to the doctor, turned out he had a clogged artery, could have been solved with a, with a stent and some medications, but he died, left the wife, four kids, and me with a business. And with the team, one of them here tonight, Tom Curtis, right here, if it would come for 30, 32 years. Um, we again, we hunkered down, we decided we're going to make a bunch of positive out of this. We built, we grew, we developed relationships, and we've been, we, the firm, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary last year. This year will be 41 years. Um, we just recruited a bunch of new people. We are in the best state that we've ever been in, and it's been a wonderful, wonderful ride. But it started with a very bumpy start. So, particularly for the students, just keep on, keep pushing. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to what you hear. We're going to sing it. Awesome. Uh, yeah, I mean, first of all, thank you guys for having me up here again. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, similar to you, David, I'm from Maryland. Oh. Yeah, strangely enough. Um, I was born and raised in Annapolis, Maryland. Oh. Uh, I uh, started at Marcus about 10 years ago. Uh, I started as an investment sales broker in our Washington, D.C. office. Uh, I knew nothing about commercial real estate when I started. So kudos to you guys for, you know, getting out here on a Thursday night. Uh, I know that's big in college and uh, <laughs> you know, taking uh, the initiative to, to learn from you know people who have done it before. Uh, when I started, uh, I, I was excited to join Marcus because I knew the training program was uh, industry standard. Uh, the leadership within the local office that I joined, I, I thought it was incredible. Uh, the people within the office were people I wanted to surround myself with and you know really, what I did was just kind of forsake everything else in my life and just focus on investment sales and growing a business, learning the industry, becoming someone that was knowledgeable enough that people much older than me would uh, respect and sit down with, because that was just the name of the game, book meetings, build relationships. Uh, was a successful broker for five years, got the opportunity to move into management, which I thought maybe fit my skill set a little bit better. Uh, was moved to a couple different offices around the mid-Atlantic, was tasked with growing those offices, was there for two years, and then was given the opportunity to move out here to Los Angeles uh, to take over the El Segundo office in charge of the South Bay and Long Beach, uh, which has been an incredible experience and something that I'm so grateful I, I was given. And uh, yeah, it's just been, uh, it's, you know, it's pretty simple. I really didn't realize how lucky I was to get into the business when I did until these past two years. You know, going through uh, my first downturn has been a terrible experience as well as a wonderful experience. I've learned so much. I'm so excited about uh, this next cycle we're about to venture out on. And, uh, I think the upside potential in this business 
is tremendous. And I think we've got a great run ahead of us. So I'm, I'm super pumped about it. Yeah, I agree with you. Uh, Dawson, we're gonna we're almost at the beginning of that next cycle. You know, it's it's uh it's it's exciting what's coming up, you know. I, I think so. I know the rates are high, but uh you know, we'll see what happens with the feds this year, but uh it's uh, it's very promising. By the way, Hunter, uh Hunter, what kind of business skills do you recommend for students or entrepreneurs a skill they should uh, learn more or apply? What do you recommend? Um, I guess uh, from like an entrepreneurial uh, aspect, I think that the largest part of my success um, has been driven by relationship building. Um, I think that as I've gotten, you know, obviously still fairly junior in the industry, but I feel that um, that a lot of the young talent that comes in has been so focused on technology um, and how technology is going to like either expedite their career or speed up the success pattern. Um, as far as real estate is concerned, there are things that have helped uh, make us more efficient um, over the course of time. Um, but I do think that this idea that, you know, <laughs> work from home and I'm going to be more efficient and all that, I mean, if you're not in your market building relationships and you're not at the front door meeting these people, um, I like I said earlier, I started in a boutique firm, and I think a large portion of the people that started big firms that had a lot of the juice behind them that weren't out on the street cold calling, knocking on doors and going door to door, as car sales meeting as that sounds, um, I think it expedited my career tenfold. Um, you didn't have the cushion and the resources. You were basically forced into an environment where it was sink or swim. Um, and I think that was probably what kind of pushed me up against my peers pretty quickly. Um, but I think that if you look at real estate in general, and I'm, I guess, coming from an aspect of industrial, but I do think this kind of transcends a lot of the different segments, is that this world is infinitely small. Um, I do deals locally. The, the Inland Empire is my sandbox, um, but from I do a national perspective, I do a lot of multi-tenant accounts. Um, I think in the last you know two months, I've been in New Jersey, Texas, Atlanta, Phoenix, um, all for just bombing trips, you're touring, and the idea that there's groups out there that there's people in my market that are going to help me in other markets, and the this. The longer I've been in it, the smaller the world's gotten. gotten. Um, and I just feel that the most important thing you can do is be present, build the relationships. I think, David, you made uh, you know a, a comment earlier that you know, this business, I, I think uh, one of my first mentors was said that you know an overnight success in this business is 15 years. And like after almost 20 years, I'm going, Wow, I thought that guy was way off base, but like he couldn't have been more accurate. Um, I think that, you know, it takes you the first five years to figure out that you have no idea what you're doing. But in the next five years, you figure out you need to ask the right questions and figure out what you need to. Um, and then after that, it's really a learning curve. Um, so um, I would say the most important thing in my experience in real estate is that this is a people business. And the building relationships is probably the most important aspect of, of, of what I do. Thanks, so. and I want to tell you, Hunter, you are in a sector of the industry that a lot of people love, but a lot of people do not know what it is. Mm -hmm. And you are my friend; you are the expert. We're going to learn so much from you tonight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's commercial real estate, right? And there's subsectors of commercial real estate, and one of those subsectors is Industrial. So, hunter and miners. What is that? What kind of main categories are in industrial real estate? Um, so, I guess you can start with the user base. Um, you you are a distribution of goods, right? So you've got the distribution guys. You've got three PLs or what are called third party logistics companies. So. If Nike doesn't want to run their own warehouse, but they want their goods to get to where they want them to go, they hire specialists who basically understand how to run a warehouse and how to get goods from point A to point B. Um, you've got a whole bunch of different subsectors of 
LTL delivery and freight forwarding and air freight. Um, um, and that is kind of the, the, the bulk of your distribution space. Outside of that, it's manufacturing, which sadly, California, you know, is uh, becoming a little bit more difficult and difficult for manufacturing to become and remain successful um, given a whole bunch of different litany of factors. But um, those are basically, the, that's the user. I don't know if, um, if you've got a couple of the slides. Yes. I figured it would maybe be a little bit easier to talk through a couple of deals that I'm working on um, that would give you an idea of what brokers do, how brokers are specialized. Um, because even if you're talking about the segment of industrial real estate, you could still break that into a handful of different independent groups that specialize on land sales, development. Uh, build the suits, developers, uh, principal side. Um, you've got uh, the tenant rep specialist. You've got the agency specialist. So um, there's, uh, and, and again, I think one of the things to think about is that real estate is so market specific um, that I could be saying something here today and you could walk away and talk to the guy that's working in Phoenix or Dallas or Atlanta and go, what was that guy talking about? Like he has no idea what he's saying. Everything is very specialized um, as far as industrial. Um, and so um, I think that's up. Okay, so I've brought three case studies for deals I'm either currently working on or deals that I've done um, in the recent past that kind of will outline a little bit of a kind of you know, interesting, at least I think are interesting kind of ideas about what's happening today. So um, this first one is located in Fontana. You can see it up. It's a huge site. So 50 acre site in Fontana. Um, and what we've done is this, this deal is probably one of my longest chase deals. So uh, it's probably taken me five, six years just to get in the room to talk to the owner. Um, How many there, years is that? Five years is it? Five or six years before I even got the first call. Um, and actually I was sitting with my wife and the guy called on like a Friday afternoon at three and his name popped up on the thing. I'm like, oh my God, I gotta take this call. That's gonna be your so okay. Like, oh, right oh, okay. <laughs> um, so five or six years just knocking down doors, calling this guy, calling this guy. And they are a one of the, the probably the, one of the largest in the US, a concrete precast manufacturing group. Um, and so what is precast concrete manufacturing? It's the K rails you see on the side of the streets, it's manhole covers, it's tubes, you know, piping big enough that you can walk through it for sewer, electrical. Um, it's a lot of the infrastructure that is down and dirty, but it's some of the most valuable infrastructure in society today. Um, and so the father, uh, who's I think 80, 90, almost 90 years old, uh, bought this site back in the day. And it was purchased, I want to say at like three, four bucks a foot, two bucks a foot. So just in today's world, that's an unbelievable number. Um, and so what this deal is, this is kind of the land purchase. So a lot of guys will specialize in land purchase. Um, this is a tenant relocation. This is a build a suit and a spec development kind of all in one. Um, so we're moving this group from Fontana, which extremely valuable land up to the high desert, um, where you can land at a quarter, less than a quarter of the cost. Um, so there's been site analysis, where's your user base, who are you selling to, how do we get you there? So there's a lot of that on the tenant rep side. The reason I brought this one up is because the development side of industrial is unbelievably risky, unbelievably rewarding, and very fun. Um, so we're building right now a, or not yet, but we'll be breaking ground on an 800,000 square foot development, which is just huge. Um, you know, you're talking football fields on football fields that you can, you know, take a half a day walk through. Um, and so what this is, is you sell this to a speculative developer, which means that you do not have a tenant in tow. You're banking on the fact that the market is going to provide a tenant down the line. Um, so these guys will understand where the rental market is, back into a lease, lease rates where you're, you know, forecasting it to be. You come up with the underwriting associated with what I can afford on the land. And you guys then basically put together this building and you then have a, you know, call it 
you know, entitlement time frame that takes in California anywhere from 18 to 24 months. And then you move into a build period from nine to call it nine to 12 months. So you're talking years out for this thing to happen. So like before my first call, this building being realized, we're talking like almost like you know, an eight year period. Um, but these are, you know, these are, this is the class A best in box. This is like what I got into the industry to do. This is like, you know, this is the most exciting project, frankly, one of the most complicated I've ever worked on. Um, so that's one side of it. Uh, and I'll try to expedite my next quote, sorry. Um, uh, the next one is, so it's agency work. Um, this is the biggest deal I've, I've done in my career to date, but it was a 1.6 million square foot building. Uh, we pitched uh, for the business, so, you know, call it CD, JLL, Cushman, Colliers, all the big groups go out and pitch the business. Um, you win it, and we were lucky enough to do so, and Centerpoint Properties was the owner. And so they gave us the opportunity to basically go out and try to either lease or sell the asset. Um, it just so happened that we, you know, million square foot buildings is a whole different size segment within the Inland Empire, but um, through marketing efforts and a long-winded, you know, year plus or minus of getting it to quality, so bringing, you know, an old Sears building up to quality, got Costco to step up and buy the building. And so they purchased it for $345 million, which was the largest purchase in the United States for an owner user that year. Uh, which was just like, you know, I don't know, I could work in this business for six years and I don't know if I'd ever do a name stepping again. Um, but, you know, this is their Southern California Regional Distribution Center. So anybody in here in this room that's ever bought anything from Costco, it is 100% that it walked right through this facility before it got to Um So adding a cooler freezer for the food, adding furniture racking and all kinds of stuff. So there's a lot of like tenant improvement stuff that goes into it. And it was just, it was a very creative and uh, interesting process, but it was basically working for the landlords of the place. Um, and then the last one. Um, and this is, is the one that we're excited about. <laughs> <laughs> this is about Tesla. So, so yeah, so um, I am lucky enough to. This was about ten re uh, representation. Ten right? rep yeah, so 10 representation. So they have been working for the landlord, completely the opposite side of the ball. Um, and this is, so I've gotten the opportunity to do Tesla's business in the Inland Empire. Um, and so this was, this is an interesting one because free Tesla and, you know, everybody, you drive down the street and I mean, it's every other car, right? Um, but you, they did not have a regional distribution center. So every part, every wheel, and then even throughout their solar department, their batteries, it was, I mean, everything that they do minus delivering the part of the retailer was coming from Northern California or Nevada. And so we started to understand as you work through what called supply chain analytics is how do I get my goods from A to B cheaper than, than what I'm doing right now? Um, and so you run all these models and you aggregate all this data and you get to the point where you go, well, if you're here and you're distributed to here, or how, you know, it's basically how all the inner workings work, where's my consumer base? How do I get my products cheaper, so my profit margin is better. Um, and so it was very interesting to work with basically rocket scientists um, that were far smarter than myself um, to understand like how to do that. Um, and so what we were able to basically accomplish was that the Inland Empire, albeit at a cheaper location than being in the South Bay, everything is driven off the ports. So the most expensive real estate will be in the ports. Uh, that's where the goods comes in. And as you move east, land's cheaper, more availability of buildings, more class A, larger, better distribution. So uh, we figured out that, you know, through all this data that, all right, X and Y meet here, here's your building. Um, Size-wise, location-wise, and, you know, your 15 million people that live in LA, here's how you're going to get more Teslas on the road. So I don't want to pat myself on the back, but I don't know if there'd be as many Teslas on the road if we didn't actually, like, oh, figure oh. out how to get <laughs> Parts, wheels, solar, and batteries back to the consumer. Um, so those are three, I think, kind of general aspects of how industrial brokers work now. Again, market specific. There's guys that live and breathe tenant rep. There's guys that live and breathe agency rep. There's guys that only do link. Um, and so 
and I'll kind of pass it back off because I feel like I've been talking for quite a while, but um, it's again, market specific. There's a lot of different ways to skin the cat. Um, and again, it goes back to informational interviews, finding the people that do these certain things, understanding what you want to do, what you don't want to do, what is fun to you, and um, yeah, yeah and find, basically it's finding the niche on each exactly. I can tell you personally, you know, when I uh, opened my broker's company over 15 years ago, you know, a lot of sales, a lot of commercial deals, representing uh, brokers, representing uh, buyers and sellers, dual agency making that extra commission. You can appreciate that thousand, all the brokers in the house. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but then I found a niche, you know, then to one exchange, maybe I can uh, learn more about it. So that's start learning about how to change properties, finding the fundamentals, and uh, how to represent those type of clients, you know, finding four units to 10 units and 20 units to 100 units. So finding that niche is important. Quick question. Yes. Yeah, I had a question for Mr. McDonald. Um, what about, that, please? So was that? <laughs> Gosh, um, but what about the industrial sector and chasing these very long deals set out to you in comparison to like, going for like multi-use or multi-family homes and apartment homes, you know, like what about, you know, this kind of intrigue you and leave it on the show? Yeah, excellent question. Real quick, uh, 30 seconds or yes, yes, yes. 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 It was the idea that it was, that you, within the supply chain, you could answer the question, not like mathematically, but data-driven. There wasn't the like, how do I feel about this space? What's well, the culture of this space? Mm -hmm. um, like multifamily, it's a zeros numbers game, right? My rent is X, my investment is Y, my return is Z. Um, you know, that kind of got a little boring. Um, I like the idea of that there's still creation and development, um, that there's still, that everybody in the industry is, does it differently. You learn every day. Uh, I drove today from Paris after doing you know, a five hour tour with JD Hunt and learning how they operate their box is incredible. Um, and so it was more of a learning process than like, how do I feel about this? I don't like the color. I don't, you know, it's like, no, there's four walls. There's a roof. It's this big. I operate it this way. My location is here. It's more of like a, it was a linear thought process uh, outside of the development part. I think Hunter appreciate it. Which leads me to what are the benefits of owning a commercial industrial? Let's, uh, let's talk about commercial real estate. David, what do you think? What are the benefits of Owning the commercial real estate assets. Cash flow. Cash flow. Appreciation. Appreciation. Leverage. Leverage. Tax benefits. Tax benefits. And it's pretty exciting and fun. <laughs> and it's cool to walk down the road with the property and go, I own it. Feels nice, right? Yeah. That 10 year to build is mine. That duplex is mine. I own this condo. This is my house. It's beautiful. Yeah, I love real estate. It was great. But Insi, how about you? What do you think? What are the benefits of owning a commercial real estate? Well, I think especially in my family, you start out with a duplex, as you said. Then you wait a couple years to grow in value, and then you refinance to buy your next one, and then maybe you get a ten unit, and then you continue on that path forward, and then you know how to run your multifamily properties. To that are less expensive, and then twenty years later, you can have even bigger ones. So I think there's there's a chance to just always get um, more value and bigger properties, and then you can go into something different too, like industrial. Yeah, and basically, you know, you you're um, in financing leverage is so important, yeah. you know, to expand your portfolio. Yeah, I was gonna touch on that. So you know, coupled with the unbelievable appreciation that real estate offers historically. You've got this ability to leverage that asset as well. Um, just to kind of simple simplify it for you, um, you know, if you bought a, a single family residence ten years ago for a million dollars, that personal residence could very easily be worth you know two million plus today. Um, when you bought that house for a million dollars, you didn't put a million dollars of your own funds into that. You, know, you maybe put two to three hundred thousand, and you leverage the rest. So with very Comparatively speaking, very minimal investment, you were able to reap the rewards of all that appreciation. You know, for a two to three hundred thousand dollar investment, your appreciation and the increase on that asset is exponential. So I think the the ability to use leverage to just maximize that appreciation and simplify it is is 
unmatched in the real estate industry. Love that appreciation. How about you, Dawson? Benefits? Yeah, I think it's, you know, everything that everyone up here said. And then, uh, you know, in addition, the idea that you can get into a property that's being run a certain way and using creativity and value add strategies, you can reshape what that asset is, increase the income, reposition it completely, um, and, you know, really expedite appreciation many times and, and, you know, use other people's money, including banks or, you know, investors to, uh, trade out of that and get into larger assets, which Mackenzie was describing. So it's just, to me, it's an investment avenue that uh, far surpasses everything else in terms of you know what you can do and uh, the type of things you can net worth you're able to generate. You know, generally, you're not speaking. By the way, you oversee over 40, 50 agents in your office, right? Yes. And so far, what kind of corrections have you seen in the market or they talk about? Yeah, uh, you know, it's been a huge correction. It's been definitely the past two years have been the wildest ride that I've been on since I've got into business, which comparatively speaking isn't you know, as long as many of the other panelists up here. But, uh, you know, we make our money through transaction velocity, buying and selling. So the advice I got when I got into private client sales, like one to $20 million assets, which is very different than, you know, what Hunter's working on. Uh, it was, you know, you can make money in a down market or an up market. You just need to know what market you're brokering through. Uh, and so when transaction velocity drops you know, 50% in such a quick time frame, it can be really scary for investment sales brokers to you know, pay their mortgage, support their family through the deals that they're closing and the commissions that they earn. Uh, but, you know, what has uh, given us confidence and uh, you know, a certain level of sustainability and hope is, is the idea that this was completely man-made. You know, this was a uh, reaction from the market to a fiscal tightening policy that we haven't seen since like savings and loans in you know, the 80s. So uh, the idea that we're gonna be able to bounce back quickly and you know, we've got like $200 billion in capital sitting on the sidelines waiting to be deployed. Uh, is really encouraging, you know, as we kind of look ahead to, you know, the back half of this year, certainly into 2025. Uh, but it's been, you know, the, the pricing gap has never been wider. You know, when you have all time pricing highs at, you know, in 2020, 2021, when interest rates were essentially, you know, you could get a loan for 2%, 3%. And, you know, now it's doubled, tripled in some cases for people. It's, uh, there's not a lot of motivation to sell when, you know, unless you have to. So uh, because of that, a lot of people just kind of waiting it out. And, uh, you know, I think uh, the idea of private client is favorable in many cases when the market corrects because people always have to sell. There's lifestyle changes. There's unforeseeable events that happen in someone's life, which causes them to have to dispose of their assets or liquidate or whatever. And so, uh, we're still doing deals, you know, as a firm, I think we did like $45 billion in volume last year. So there's certainly a ton of deals happening. And that, I think, you know, I listened to our earnings call just earlier this week. That was only like 7% market share, you know, across the country. So there is still a ton of deals happening. It's just making sure that we're capturing, you know, what is, uh, what we need to and uh, positioning ourselves for, uh, you know, the, the next, 12, 18, 30 months. Which leads me to the next question, David. You know, capital rates right now are trending up, you know, in some markets, you know. Can you talk a little bit about uh, cap rates, uh, the change in evaluations? I will. And my comments may seem a little contrarian to what you would expect. Um, are, are people familiar with cap rates? Nobody cap rates. So uh, cap rates are a measure of yield. And as such, they tend to trend along with interest rates. Now, over the last couple of years, interest rates went up close to 500 basis points. So how much have cap rates gone up? 25 to 150 basis points, maybe, depending on the asset class and office is a whole other thing. But uh, for most product types, Cap rates have not risen anywhere near 
to the level that interest rates have risen. It's been a little confusing and a little confounding because you would think that they would kind of run in step. So yeah, there's been a market correction as uh, activity has slowed down. There have been a lot of reasons that, that that's happened. But uh, the, the downward trend in valuations has been nowhere near what we thought it was going to be. And toward the end of last year, I, mean, I, I speak on a number of different panels, and I, I was projecting that the great asset repricing was coming. But it had to happen. You couldn't have this huge disconnect between where interest rates have gone and where cap rates have gone. At some point, they have to equalize out. And what we're seeing now, I'd be interested to hear what the rest of the panel say, but last year, obviously, cap rates went up, values came down a bit. Uh, with the amount of cap rates went up, generally in our asset class, values came down 10 to 20 percent ish. And that's bad, but nowhere near what one would think that it should have. And now, in just in the last month and a half or so, we've seen cap rates kind of stabilize as the Fed has stopped pushing interest rates up. We're starting to hear about and see more buyers coming into the marketplace. There seems to be a little more velocity, more activity, a little more lending happening. And the big thing that, uh, in my book, is helping to keep the markets from being a lot worse than they are is that there's a very accommodative stance in the lending community. I've been through a number of cycles, and when the lending community is driven by banking regulators who are saying you have to mark your assets to market, you have to revalue your assets, and you have to acknowledge that you have these problems, and you have to do something about it. That drives the banks to have certain policies, and they become very aggressive about trying to collect on loans that are delinquent. What's going on today is completely the opposite of that. I, I feel with a lot of banks, I know very few that are being aggressive about trying to force their borrowers to put more equity into their deals. Instead, what's happening, I mean, there is some of that, um, but more than anything, we're seeing banks extending on a short-term basis, extending borrowers' loans to get them from here to there in the hopes that interest rates will start coming down and by the time the borrowers have to refinance, it'll be a better marketplace. And that's leading to a lot of stability in the marketplace. There's, uh, we talked about this in our, in our prep call, there's currently somewhere between $1.5 and $1.8 trillion of commercial and multifamily mortgages that will be turning out, coming due in, say, the next 18 months. It's a huge wall, and those loans that underwrote beautifully when interest rates were low, they don't underwrite so well today when interest rates are so much higher. <clears throat> and yet we're not seeing this disaster happen. I know a lot of people that have worked in the troubled asset space, they've been gearing up, they've been getting ready to go, and they're just not seeing the activity. I, I can give you a few statistics. Last week was the National Mortgage Bankers Conference down in San Diego. So you had commercial mortgage lenders from all over the country. I talked to one life insurance company that has 3,500 commercial mortgage loans in their portfolio. 20% of them are office. Do you know how many delinquencies they have right now? Zero. There's not a single delinquent loan. It's amazing. I talked to a mortgage banker two days ago who manages a portfolio of six and a half billion dollars of commercial mortgage loans that their company is making. Their delinquency rate is less than one percent. They have other colleagues similar, less than one percent. So where's the distress? Because we we hear about uh, disaster and remote falling apart. There are a lot of office towers that have been a disaster and they're being repurposed. They're going back to lenders. The office building is one I worked in. The owner lost it back to the lender. The lender put it up for sale. And when they put the building up for sale, they advertised it. And this is right here on Century Boulevard. 
It's right, right by the airport. So 250,000 square foot class B office building. When they put it up for sale, they advertised it as potential office turnaround or multifamily reposition or low income housing or my favorite self storage. <laughs> It ended up being purchased at a pretty low price by an office property investor who was moving its offices into the building, plans to invest in the building, put more money into it, and he's buying it for the very long term. Now, what was the big deal that works for him? He bought it for cash. So he doesn't have debt service that he's got to worry about. He can afford to take a long term perspective that over the next five years, 10 years, 20 years, that that office is going to do better, attract more tenants and create more cash flow. And so yeah, values are down. We're seeing them. That's what we do. We analyze them. But nowhere near what I thought it would be. And it, in, in my book, there's amazing strength in this market. And I think the markets are turning. And I think we're going to see some better times ahead. It's very surprising. I mean, a lot of it is driven by your net cap flow. And the accommodative nature of the one percent. Yeah, right. That's what's happening right now. Can I have a quick question? Actually, it's awesome. That's that's going to be you're going to be talking about multi-family sales velocity. And so stay there. Ask the question. And continue. So, I'm I'm curious at the uh, at MBA table to go. If, what about when these loans start to mature and people have to start making decisions? Who think that they're going to be stressed at that point, and we'll start seeing you know short sales and I have people struggling. I did think that six months ago, four months ago. I'm not thinking that so much anymore because what I'm seeing is I talked to a few credit officers at banks. I talked to chief investment officers, insurance companies. They don't want to take a very aggressive stance. They don't want to own the real estate. They would rather do a short term extension. Maybe somebody's coming due on what was a, an eight year loan, 10 year loan. So give them a one-year extension. They'll do it interest only, maybe uh, put, put some of it on negative amortization, you know, get them a lower pay rate, amortize more of it toward the back end of the loan. But they're trying to keep people in the loans to get out of this downward cycle and into an upward cycle. And that, that's what we're seeing so far. Do you think that the rubber is going to be the road at some point as far as certain markets and certain asset classes? Like they can't, they can't, it's not a, the party's got to end at some point for some of this. Maybe. And I don't, I'm not talking about the whole, we're not talking about that one. It's a wait again, but I just think that some asset classes, like if you have an active place in an office building, a 40% vacant market at some time, someone's going to cut our fund. So that's a whole different story because you're talking about product that's become functionally out. Absolutely. Okay. That, 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 there's, right. there's not okay. a demand for that space anymore. I think that's a different story than most other asset classes where there is still demand for the product that's just driven by the hospital loan market. Fair. And I I mean I may be wrong. You know, we may come back six months or a year from now and I may have my face. But from what I'm seeing, I'm I'm watching the CMBS special servicers, most of the special servicing. Uh, we deal with one large special service service CITUS, and they uh, they do special servicing for so special servicing is where commercial mortgage backed securities loans go to when they become distressed assets. And uh, we've been trying to hustle them for business. We love it when things go bad because they need to the price. They have two assets in California. Two assets. They cover the whole country. Two assets in California. They're both large high-rise office buildings. One in downtown LA and you know, in San Francisco. They're shocked. We're shocked. We're just not seeing it. And when I, I, I talk to banking regulators, there's a group that I run and we bring regulators to talk to bankers. And so I talk to regulators all the time. One of them, we have a text chain going back and forth. He keeps writing to me. And this is a, a, an air, like a regional representative, a, a regional overseer for the Federal Reserve. And he keeps writing to me, Dave, I don't understand. Interest rates are up 500 basis points. The marketplace is slow. And yet apartment buildings are still selling at a five cap. They should be at a seven hundred cap. They're still trading at five cap. I don't get it, but that's what's happening. And we're 
we're not being pushed from political forces, from economic forces. We're not being pushed to push the banks to take an aggressive stance. And that's helping to keep the marketplace stable. Uh, David, I haven't seen negative on decisions so many years, but you're going to start seeing that. Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the solutions we're going to talk about later. Uh, computer, uh, that's topic of some velocity. Something. Yeah. Uh, so my office is about 80% multifamily agents. There's like 29,000 apartment buildings, four units in, uh, in the South Bay. So we do a ton of multifamily business. Uh, and velocity certainly down. It's followed the market probably not so bad at forty percent. Uh, and you know, I, I don't really know how much there is to say about this other than we're still doing deals. Buyers are purchasing all cash. You know, when you look at LA multifamily, we're in like this little club. You know, it's very different than if you went to you know, some suburb outside of Indianapolis, uh, that market is going to be much more distressed and probably frozen for some time, as opposed to what we have here, just because there's so many people with deep pockets um, that, it, you know, the, the, the all cash purchaser is still active and, you know, they're kind of rubbing their hands right now and excited that they're getting five and a half, six caps, you know, where, Three years ago, they were looking at three and a half, four caps. Uh, so, sales velocity, I think it's going to pick up. You know, LA apartments, there's not a lot of dirt. You know, we're in a housing crisis. Supply far outpaces demand uh, from a renter standpoint. I think the biggest hurdle, at least in my brief time here, uh, that I've seen is just legislation constantly changing, growing hurdles, you know, and speed bumps in front of landlords that they have to overcome. But uh, as long as there's, you know, a 10 person wait list for an apartment building with like in unit laundry, uh, or even not, you know, there's always going to be a, a buyer for uh, sellers or, you know, they'll start to come around as um, there's, you know, unforeseen things that happen, which, you know, they're forced to sell the building, unfortunately. But uh, I would imagine as soon as we get a rate cut and banks start to kind of open up a little bit more. We'll be right back. Can't we'll wait for that moment, right? Maybe Q3. Yeah, that would be more important to say. Yeah, I mean, I can't I wait. December is going to be, you know, October, November, December, fourth quarter of this year. We get, you know, one, maybe two rate cuts, and banks start to feel more comfortable opening up again um, instead of really pricing themselves out of the market. Uh, we're going we're gonna to get a flood of activity, you know, LA apartments. I agree with you. Mackenzie, what do you think your business on seeing a lot of, um, Deals this year, less than last year, or vice versa? You know what, actually, around this time last year, there was a lot of applications because of the transfer tax. So I know we were very, very busy for that like month and a half, and we don't be off itself. Um, but I would say that we're about 70% refinances right now, and then we have 20% acquisitions, and then we're doing like 10% assumption. So it's still more refinances with people who have to. And the other people are just waiting. And then when we do look at apartment buildings, I think we're more at a like a 50 to 55 percent LTV. Mm -hmm. And that means people have to put more money down, or they lose it to people who do all cash offers. I think the LTV, what is that? Well, the value. So uh, when when I'm looking at a deal for underwriting, we have our UCR debt coverage ratio and our loan to value. So we have two people of those metrics. So in a in a market like Los Angeles, where the values are pretty are very high, we do a cash flow analysis, and we are normally debt um, debt uh, coverage uh, ratio restrained. Um, so basically, we're more looking at value. So values basically are higher, and a lot of people have to put more money down. Thank you for your comments. In 130 seconds or less, the usage of industrial real estate remains possible, right? Sorry, give me any usage of what? Of, of your, in your world, industrial real estate. Uh, is it positive or negative right now, the usage? Uh, tenant demand has slowed. Uh, interest rates, inflation rates have definitely course corrected. I think a lot of what has taken place is more attributed as far as industrial real estate is related to the port. Yeah. Um, port activity through union and labor negotiations was dramatically slowed. So it impacted a huge portion of what goods were coming in through LA and Long Beach. 
Um, that on top of this incredible spike that we've had through COVID, like office got dinged, you know, everybody that wanted more boxes in their homes, people were using Amazon and e-commerce platforms, you know, and our percentage of our national you know, uh, population is never near some of what China and other countries do to actually get those boxes to your home as quickly as they do. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we are somewhat insulated. And again, I'm going to go back to, it's, this is a market to market question. Um, but the idea that we are in a little bit of a slowdown, I think we rubber banded so high so fast that there's obviously a hangover that's taking place now. Um, but I do think that the long-term benefits and the need for industrial real estate far outpace the kind of call it year blip that we're about to go through where rates are falling, values are falling, interest rates. And as long as, as long as this kind of continues to work itself out, I think that the construction pipeline has been so affected by a lot of the, the uh, municipalities that it's going to turn around and there's going to be a subsequent spike back in the in the, the value of industrial. So a little bit of a slowdown. We're in a bumpy path. As soon as some of these tenants kind of understand the marketplace and there's some certainty of how they can operate uh, mm -hmm. moving forward, I think we'll be fine. Um, yeah. Hey, by the way, uh, do you see how you're going to deals are made structuring transactions? What, what have, have you seen so far? Yeah, so I, I get this is for mortgage debt. And it's when they're maturing, we're probably rolling over to adjustable. And um, there are challenges in the refinance market. And some of those challenges are the same challenges that are impacting, to be honest, the multifamily sales velocity. And that's understanding how the lenders underwrite and qualify commercial loans. So the multifamily loans that Mackenzie and I are doing are they're constrained by the debt service coverage ratio. And to further explain a little bit about what that is, is it's basically a ratio that shows how the net operating income of the property covers the annual debt service. So what kind of cash flow is coming from the property to cover the mortgage loans? So typically the lenders, you know, they vary by their, you know, how conservative or aggressive they are on the debt service coverage ratio. But in this market, maybe traditionally, even typically law, uh, you know, we'll run 20 debt service coverage ratio, which basically means that the cash flow from the property covers 120% of the mortgage expense. Well, this year you have, you know, that's impacting the sale velocity and also going to ultimately impact the debt that was rolling to adjustable and looking to refinance. This is the fact that we're going to be negatively affecting both sides of that equation. <laughs> So we're gonna take the annual debt service. So let's, let's just say a refinance transaction. Yeah. Um, a refinance transaction that we did a handful of years ago at potentially three, three and a half percent, if that's rolling over, it's rolling over to a much higher interest rate. So that's increasing your annual debt service. If you wanna refinance that same debt today, I have to qualify it based on a much higher mortgage expense interest rate. So I'm increasing the bottom part of that equation. So I need the top part of that equation, the net operating income, to basically increase substantially, even refinance your loan at your current loan. So, and, and sometimes that's going to work. Um, I have like two scenarios I've been talking to the clients this week. You know, one is a deal we did years ago. The the debt's going to be rolling to the adjustable period, and the investors are going to want to refinance that. And when talking to the client, the investors have been very active. You know, they raised rents as they as they could. As apartment units rolled and vacated, they renovated those units. They were actively increasing the income from, from that property. Um, so they have a chance at you know being able to you know refinance their current loan amount without having to come in with cash funds or you know maybe taking a little bit of cash out. Um, the other scenario is again, I think we've used, I know you talked Ryan earlier in the reception about accessory dwelling units or ADUs and the the power those have to influence really your multifamily assets. Um, it's the ability because of the lack of housing in Los Angeles to be able to add units to an existing property. So this scenario is I guess the ADU scenario gone bad. The borrower bought the property with plans to add ADUs. He put some short-term debt, you know, three year fix with plans to refinance that property, but in potential he didn't he didn't add the ADUs. So he didn't he didn't increase the income. So now his debt's gonna be rolling over. 
He's got income where it was three years ago. His mortgage expense is going to, you know, the rate's going to be double. I mean, he's going to have to make the decision whether to cut in the cash to refinance that debt, maybe keep it in the adjustable period, or potentially sell. So it's, you know, the, the impact of the interest rates is exponential on the, both the refinance and the, the purchase transactions. Yeah, but we are looking at this. I mean, I guess the options that's not right now. Big money sanity, sit down, do anything. What are your comments on that? Yeah, so right now, in every sense of talk. By the way, I just need to know how many investors in the house tonight? Raise your hand. Quite a few. So let's learn what's happening right now on the option, non option products that are available today. Go ahead. All right. So a lot of our clients are doing shorter term loans. So it's not the five year. So Freddie and Fanny, we can do anything from five years to 30. So most of our clients are doing the five year route and trying to do a flexible prepayment. So Fannie Mae does not actually offer uh, flexible prepayments. They're more yield maintenance or defeasance. Um, and Freddie Mac right now is our is our star because they offer flexible prepayment penalties. Let's say if you have a five year uh, term, you have a five year five four three two one prepayment prepayment penalty. So if you were to refinance in the second year, you pay four percent. So we also have another structure that is more people are trying to do is the three two one one one. So you get the loan. And you want a five year, and they think in, in year three they want to sell it. So at least you're, you're having a one percent prepayment penalty versus a three percent. So I think that's more of what we're getting, and then a lot of interest only. So that's since we are in a high interest rate environment, when, we're, when we give them one or two years of interest only, we look like rock stars. And then also for those two years, um, they don't have they can pay the interest only as well. So those are some solutions that some investors can can look at. So this is the fun part right now of the panel discussion. Predictions. What do you think, uh, Dave? In less than sixty seconds, everyone predictions if that's possible. I think for the long term, the value investor don't take too much risk today, but stay in the market. There's it, one thing I learned back in business school, buy low, sell high. So <laughs> what, you know, sounds simple, but in practice, actually doing it, we tend to get really excited when the market's going up. Oh, it's a good time to buy. Guess what? That's a good time to sell. Right now, the market's going down a bit. Kind of a good time to buy. So be a value investor. Look out there for opportunities. If you look for multifamily where you can add some units, look for value add type opportunities. Be bold, be brave, and be prudent. And this is I learned from you, uh, David. Overall yields attractive in commercial real estate, right? Yeah. This year. Yeah. Dawson? Yeah, I, I think spot on. Yeah, you know, if, uh, right now analysts are predicting, I think it's like a 33% chance we get a rate cut in June. Uh, you know, you can get in on a deal. Uh, execute a value add strategy, refinance your money out when you know rates get lowered a little bit. Be that this year, or next year, you know, 2022, 20, when it all kind of started coming down, uh, everyone starts talking about survive till 25. And I think uh, that has, you know, I think that stands true today. Uh, and so, um, yeah, I, I don't really have much to add. You know, <laughs> Thanks, Missy. Um, I, I think rates, you know, I think as we're seeing are going to stay higher for longer than the markets initially expected. Um, you know, the, the minutes from the Fed meeting show that the Fed's more concerned about lowering rates too soon than they are about keeping them too high for too long. So I think this higher rate environment will, you know, maybe stick around longer than we were anticipating. But I also feel there's a lot of, um, you know, capital out there. The metrics of the deals just don't make sense for a lot of investors who are, you know, really using leveraging, you know, leverage to deploy that capital to really, you know, make a lot of big investments at this time. Um, with the interest rates higher and the cap rates, you know, not increasing as much, it, there's a little bit of a gap there for for most investors. So, um, and I don't know if it's a huge gap, um, but you know, you need the, the financing market to be a little better. 
or you need the cap rates to go up to make the deals pencil for a lot of active investors. So this is uh, your statement. You said rebuilding year, right? Oh yeah, I did say rebuilding year. I think on one of our prep calls. <laughs> um, and maybe it's a rebuilding year or two, um, but I think the market also offers a lot of opportunity. Um, the, this is the you know, second big you know, shift in the markets and downturn. Um, and kind of thinking of you guys as students, I mean, it's a new market. Lenders that were here last year aren't here. People that you work with, you know, and there's so much change and so much uncertainty that I think that also presents an opportunity for people to jump in and lay the groundwork down now to be in a position to really capitalize on when things improve and that next, that next run, if you will. So I think it's a great opportunity for people getting into the market to learn a market that isn't all always amazing to understand kind of both sides of it as well and i think it's a, it's a great time to to get your feet wet in the industry yeah I, I couldn't agree with almost everything you said i have more that's what you said i think interest rates are going to stay uh, up for longer i don't think we're going to get a june drop back um i think that uh, the user base which at the end of the day you don't have the people paying rent, be it a tenant in your multifamily or be it a tenant in your industrial building. They are the ones driving value. And we're seeing a drop back. And I can't speak to multifamily, but as far as industrial, we're seeing a retraction in rental rates. We're seeing, just like everybody said, the interest rates and the cap rates are not matching up. I think that 2024 is going to continue to retract as far as industrial value. Uh, but I think the long-term aspects of it are going to far outpace um, the minor setback that we're going to have through 2024. And most, I think, a good portion of 2025 until tenant velocity and demand deck back up. And I think that construction with interest rates, um, the, the interest rates might really curve a lot of the land purchase, which slows down development, which down the line leads to supply shortages. So I do think that we're going to have a period of time now where uh, where rates are going to pull back, jobs are going to drop. We really got to be keen on what this interest rate and what the inflation more likely does. Um, and I I think that in an election year that and this is in no way shape of political conversation, but I think that in election year things are very volatile. Things couldn't be more volatile volatile at this point in time with what's going on. So I just think that it's. We, there are some bumpy roads ahead, um, but as far as my asset class, I think there's you know, uh, a real light at the end of the rainbow in a very short period of time. I agree, Mackenzie. Well, I agree with you all, <laughs> um, but I will say in the beginning of this year, we thought, I think a lot of our clients thought that the rates were gonna go down right away, and they didn't. So we were just sort of hanging out just watching where everything was. And we actually had a call today with my company, and I think people are now realizing that it's not going to happen anytime soon mm -hmm. um, or in the near future. So people are starting to look in the market more and realize that this is it's not going to go down. <laughs> so, but they said that the ice is melting, and um, people are starting to transact. Mm -hmm. By the way, this is coming from the students, you know, how can they make themselves more comfortable this year? What do you think, Um, I mean, the first step is you're here at this university. Like, take advantage of what the university offers you. Take the courses that are relevant to what you want to do. Um, you know, you might seem to have a lot more robust with the real estate advisory council mm -hmm. than we have when I attended. Um, but take advantage of those opportunities. I'll also say, you know, real estate is an industry that you learn from actually doing it. So don't be afraid to jump in, you know, go get an internship, try to find an entry level job. Whatever you're doing, even if it's as menial as making copies of files, you're still being exposed to things and starting to understand the business. Um, also networking, I wouldn't be afraid to go out there and get involved in different networking groups. Um, you know, take advantage of attending, you know, industry events, you know, some different industry events might have, you know, some discounted rate for students. I think this business is the more you know, your knowledge is key, and also the people you know, you can start making those connections and obtaining that knowledge, you know, right here during the time that I would need. So that would be my suggestion. And by the way, the latest one is AI. So what are your comments on AI, Hunter? 
Um, there's a lot of thoughts and a lot of money being dumped into it. Um, I think I'll take the question as it and right back to my specialty sure. and what how I see it. Um, I think it is going to be a tremendous value for the actual tenant base. Um, how do I get more efficient? How do I how do, how, how do I make my process cheaper? How do I create a, a situation by which my warehouse is more safe? I, I was in a meeting the other day, and there is a now an AI field that videotapes all the warehouse and then tracks like unsafe and insecure you know polio product or pallets that are out, and so it like sets off alarm bells. There's drones that I watched the other day go through a warehouse and read barcodes and immediately scan back to companies where the product is, how much they have, where the tenant is. I mean, it is, it's incredible. Um, and I don't know, and again, I'm gonna go back to what I said in the beginning, this is a people business. So I think that if anything, it will create efficiencies. It will probably cut down on the total base, maybe of brokers or, um, people needed, but I don't think this is an industry that will ever be completely absorbed by AI where other companies, you know, other you know, formats will be because there's too much relationship business that takes place um, that will just never be totally cast away by AI. But I think that the future of it is unbelievably both exciting and scary because I don't think it's really found its place yet. Um, within our field, um, and I don't think the the total wherewithal of what it can do has really been the, the knowledge hasn't been totally applied to what it, what, what the potential is. So the common sense. I think there's a lot of yeah, exactly. Right. Let's open up a Q and A real quick, and uh, so let's have a let's start here. Yeah. I think I have two questions. One is I heard a lot of uh, high rating buyer, high rating buyers, but. Do we agree that historically in the debt culture in American real estate, we're probably just a little bit above the end of the median over the last hour of the year? Even if you throw out the 80s and if you throw out the last 10 years, we're probably close to the middle. But this kind of a question for everybody in the lending side of it, that started with Tom and David's and we were talking about without the regulatory push on the lenders to uh, reassess and reprice, and the lenders are therefore just extending and extending. That seems dangerously close to what happened with the buildup in Japan in the 80s and then what they call the lost decade from 91 to 2001, where they, were, they just never, they just never, like you said, bit the bullet. Like they just never said, hey, we've got to reprice this. And then uh, they just sort of let it slide. And as a result, they, they had a, a, a lost decade, they had a flat decade of uh, economics. How, how similar do you guys see what's happening in America today to what? that culture was back then. I'll, uh, I'll take a shot at that. Um, I lived through that in the 80s, and I think this is very, very different today. The biggest difference I see is the, the liquidity of the market. There's so much capital out there that's looking for a home. There, there are people with war chests ready to put money into real estate. There are investment funds that have capital that they have to deploy. In the 80s, the savings and loan industry went away, and there, there was no capital. There was a huge liquidity crisis. You couldn't get debt. Today, uh, there are banks, there are insurance companies, there are agency lenders, but there are also there's a huge industry of private debt funds, a huge amount of capital that's available. So when, when I look at the worst case scenario for some of these borrowers that are kind of in trouble, what do they have to do? They have to put more capital in, into their asset, uh, uh, cash in, refi. A lot of people have the capital to do that. If they don't have the capital and they can't get a conventional loan, they can get a private fund loan. And the interest rate may be a little bit higher, but if it keeps them in their property, people believe that they can keep going. So I, I think that's a very different marketplace. Um, and I, I frankly, I think overall it's, it's much more stable. Thank you. Next question. Somebody else? Here, go ahead. Um, with the January CPI numbers coming in a bit high and the 10 year treasury kind of jumping uh, somewhat based on that, have you guys, have you seen buyers and sellers react to that? CPI? Yeah, right. uh, well, so we were based off of the treasury. I mean, again, that was, I believe in like in February, it's gone up like 35 basis points. 
for a fanny loan, you're floating until you walk. So again, if things keep on, if someone thinks that um, the rate's gonna go up higher, you can lock right then and there, as opposed to someone's like, hey, I'm gonna wait another month and see where the is going to be. So they can technically fluctuate or they can wait or whatever they're thinking is gonna happen. Um, if it's gonna go down or up, they can lock when they want to. You reminded me when I purchased my first office building, two margin connected to the officer journals index. It was 11%. I was like, what? Over 13 years ago. Great question. Somebody else? Yeah, Chris. Uh, Chris, I'll thank you for the really quick. Uh, the question I wanted to ask was we talked a little bit earlier about how the debt ceiling comes in about 18 months and how we're not seeing uh, the people who are as aggressive. And then we touched a little bit on the obsolescent uh, buildings, but we didn't really delve into what's going to happen to these buildings. You can't be very good on the based on how big the area is. So what, what, do, what do you think is going to happen? What are we going to see? I don't know. <laughs> in my own practice, I'll, I'll just give you a, a small piece as well. So I run a professional services business. We have 4,000 square feet of office space, room for close to 20 people to be in the office. I have three that go into the office on a regular basis. And I'm answering that question every day. Right? I, I had to re-up my lease, my lease came due, I had a nice extension option. I had to wrestle with it and I had to put my money where my mouth, where my mouth was. And I extended that lease out for, for another five years. And I'm not really sure what we're gonna do with all that space. I don't know what it's gonna look like at the end of five years. It's it's a big question. Uh, and I to deal with office owners, um, uh, developers, REITs, and, all the big office buildings, they're trying to figure out the same thing. When they have these big office towers downtown, and you're right, but retrofitting those into multifamily, I mean, it sounds good, but when you get into it, or still it, you're doing all systems, but it's prohibitively expensive. I, honestly, I don't think the marketplace knows yet what's going to happen with all this. Yeah, I know some, some colleagues are like converting, you know, those office buildings into residential. But the problem has to be older to make sense, economically speaking, you know, yeah. kind of new building, but great question. Uh, anybody else? That's a cool follow up, go ahead, follow up. Is it, is it feasible to bet on these buildings? You say these buildings, you mean downtown high rises? <laughs> yeah. What are you thinking? Give me a I mean, yeah, because no. I know it's really, no, is it even possible? If you're talking about like downtown office CBD, 70 story building, like no chance. You better figure out something to do with it. On the other hand, or contrarian for one time. Okay. Um, we, we looked at comps comparing the sales. And uh, we were looking for sales. It was a, a five day office building in Orange County. And we were looking at sales of five day office buildings in Orange County. We found one sale that was, uh, I think, it was a 1990s bill, a class A office building. Beautiful building, glass and steel, a little bit. It was purchased with the intention of tearing it down and putting it in the house business. There was city four in the city in Orange County. Pardon? There was four in Orange County. Four. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I, but I, I guess my comment was to like, are you going to rip down like 515 flower? Yeah. You know. I view the owners of being on the like this. Making it a place that's desirable that people want to come back to and work out of the that it does give you the option. It's just a matter of like how long it's going to take for people to want to go back to the town, spend time there, enjoy not just where they're working, but everything around there that you know made it what it is originally. I think also, and I don't know, and this isn't really my space, but I know I'm personally seeing and hearing about a shift of back to the office. So I, I don't know how that would play in, and you know the 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 power shifted a little bit back to the employers in the softening market, and a lot of those employers, same as David, they're looking at their space with no one in it. Why are we running a space? And there's a push at this point. What I'm seeing is to get people back to those office spaces. Uh, companies that maybe did go hybrid or remote want people back in the office. So I, I don't know how that will impact it, but it is. 
I mean, the office was definitely an interesting segment of the market that has been severely negatively impacted by COVID. Yeah. Thanks for your comments. We're going to finalize the. Uh, okay, go ahead, one more. Yeah. yeah. So, um, coming from the younger audience, someone who might be looking to get into something perhaps in the near future, um, with all the trends going on and like uh, e commerce and everything going on with like commercial because in like retail, because I'd say like for like an entry level investor, I'd probably say like the other go to other than um, like multi family residential would be like small commercial, small like retail commercial. Like, with all those trends coming in, tenants being more volatile with rent, which is something that I've noticed. Um, do you think that there's going to be like a shift for like entry level investors to move towards industrial rather than retail? Uh, that's again, that's a pretty market specific question, right? So if you're talking about Savannah, Georgia, or are you talking about Inland Empire, right? I think there's a huge delta in between that. I, uh, I was lucky enough that when I started, it was very investable. So uh, generally, I know we bought uh, a couple of pieces of land that were truck and trailer parking deals that I 1031 into a 20,000 square foot building that I then leveraged and then did a bottom of and then turned that into a 20,000 square foot building. I think right now you're going through a pretty significant revaluation of market. Yeah. Um, entry level investment, you know, I think that's kind of another ballpark question that we're going to have to cap, right? Are you going to walk in with, you know, 250 bucks a foot on a 20,000 square foot building that's class B, that's got a tenant in place. I mean, there's, there's are, there are huge numbers now. Um, right. But again, I think if you get outside of what is the number one market in the US, yes, absolutely. I think it's your willingness to understand a market outside of what's maybe in your backyard or the most expensive LA market, you know, yeah. Southern California market. You know, around that, can I go to a secondary or tertiary market that's seeing growth? Where is that growth taking place? Where is the distribution? Where are the ports that are being, you know, you know, Savannah had a huge explosion, mm -hmm. um, you know, because their port was dredged out and you could bring in bigger containers. Um, so, are there areas where, yes, it is going to be functionally, you know, easier as a big, you know, a beginning investor to get in? Absolutely. Is it in these core markets that have become so institutionalized yeah. that it's like, you know, I mean, you're you're fighting, you want to fight against Blackstone, you're going to have a tough time. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. It's, it, it's kind of the truth, right? But it's like, what is that next tertiary market that is prime for growth? Where is the population density? Who needs the Amazon boxes that are housed? How are they getting them? Are they not there yet? Where is the truck traffic coming from? I think those are some of the answers, or I guess the questions that you start asking yourself to start predicting those things out in the future. Yeah. Thank you for your comments. Uh, I need to talk to you guys about real estate uh, our society and the uh, certificate program. And we have our representative, our friend from our real estate advisory council, Erin. Come on. <laughs> I'm going to put you on the spot. He on, has done on, so much uh, on a certificate program. This has been a great, great discussion, and I appreciate everybody's time. One of the questions I wanted to ask is, what are you forecasting rent growth multifamily in LA in terms of your underwriting, as well as industrial for 2025? Where do you think that rent growth is? Because that affects pro forma is underwriting everything. So I'd love to hear your answer. I encourage all students to network grow your brand, grow your, your, your network, complete the certificate program, talk to specialists in different market segments to figure out what you enjoy doing. Because obviously industrial is great. I do retail, it's kind of boring, but I love it. Um, so great stuff. Appreciate it. everybody's help today. Thank you. Comments, final words. Uh, David, final words, each of you. Yeah, my final word is cultivate your ability to listen. Be a good listener. That's probably the best skill that you can develop. People love to talk. If you ask them questions and then close your mouth and let them talk, you can learn so much and it will help you to build relationships with people. Everybody likes to talk to them. Thank you. Be a good listener. Awesome. Yeah, for the students, and, you know, those graduating and entering the workforce, uh, I would say, you know, what you think you want to do now might not what you want to be what you want to 
might not be what you want to do 10 years from now, but whatever it is, go attack it. Yeah, you know, every single one of us on this panel are pretty easy to find. We, you know, anybody who's hiring is getting dozens of applications a day. So uh, go above and beyond, find their contact info, reach out to Rex, and uh, just attack whatever it is you want to do, full steam ahead, dive all in, and, uh, you know, you'll figure it out from there. Or attack, execute, that's the uh, mental broker, right? <laughs> Lucy? Um, I think just touching on like branding yourself and, you know, that starts really at day one, you know, it really starts here at your time here at LMU and in your career, even if it's in your entry level position or as you go through, um, as we've touched on the real estate industry is a very personal industry. And although you may be working for a large company and you're really growing your client base and expanding upon that based on your personal brand, and your reputation. That's why I kind of keep going back to you. So I, I focus on, uh, you know, kind of honing your personal brand and your reputation, and uh, that that carries through in your career from from entry level to higher positions. Build your personal brand. Good advice. Thank you. Uh, uh, I'm going to say David took my first one because I was going to end with listen and absorb. The first five years of your career, learning how to listen and just absorb as much as you can. Don't work from home. Get in the office. Get off your ass. Be friends with you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like be, be, you can't learn anything if you're working from home. Mm -hmm. The people that are 20 years elder that understand what's going on, that you're just going to learn from. Um, I think it's one of those things where, like, another thing is you can't pick your family, but you can pick the people you work for. And I think picking the right mentor and the family that you have around you in the work environment will either ultimately, you know, slow you down or slingshot you into the future. So be very thoughtful um, about, you know, it not being the person that you want to go have a beer with, but the person that's going to get you the next step. Pick your own community. Thank you. Okay. And I'll say be proactive. And ask questions because you're not expected to know everything. But if you're proactive in asking the questions and then trying to find more answers to those questions too, I think that that's don't be afraid to ask questions. This was amazing, right? This is a lot of time. I want a picture this time. Thank you guys so much for coming. Really appreciate it. The students, parents, uh, anybody that's involved, my colleagues, uh, your colleagues, my colleagues. Uh, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Really well, no, we See you next time. Give you a message, uh, email, our uh, next event.